Watching the comparative analysis on the holographic screen, I was eager to see how a great pyramid was conceived and designed, and what were the exceptional technological solutions to build one. Obviously, I was not expecting to see something like designing at the drawing board, with ruler, compass and pencil, or even in front of a computer, using various specialized programs for this. But I was very passionate about the process of thinking about and designing the project, especially through the lens of the advanced technology of an alien civilization, because I had no idea that such a grand and incredibly sophisticated project was possible, such as designing a great pyramid, is something common and easy to do. A proof of this is the fact that, at the level of knowledge and technological possibilities that scientists and engineers have at their disposal today, they still cannot design and erect such a gigantic construction, the difficulties of design and especially of concrete realization that would arise from this would be insurmountable for them. As soon as I made that wish, the synthetic analysis sequence was interrupted and I was shown a map of southern Egypt. Then the picture suddenly changed and I saw a group of six beings, four of them extraterrestrial and two earthlings, gathered in a large room, possibly inside a ship. Three out of the four extraterrestrial beings were Syrians, as I recognized them by their tall stature, over two and a half meters, pearly white skin color, and slightly elongated skull towards the back. The fourth alien being belonged to a race unknown to me, with very white skin, silver hair, and purple eyes. As I perceived telepathically, the two earth beings came from Atlantis. They were all standing around a huge blue hologram of a pyramid in the middle of the hall. The hologram was shrouded in a milky light, and the edges of the pyramid glowed discreetly white. Every being in that room was intervening with hand movements in the hologram, modifying or adding elements. At the same time I saw a lot of information on the edge of the hologram, symbols, shapes and secondary representations that moved and changed continuously. Everything was dynamic, active and at the same time full of meaning and coherence. I felt beyond any doubt that what I was seeing, as a synthesis of the design of a great pyramid, was a work very deeply grounded in cosmic laws and principles, having only peripherally to do with the calculations of its physical structure. As I was soon to understand, these calculations resulted directly from the subtle structure of the pyramid and were therefore perfect, because the construction of the edifice was not only about its physical elements, the stone blocks, but primarily about the subtle energetic elements and their correct integration into a much larger, cosmic structure. If we consider them at the level of principle, these conclusions are very important, because they show us the erroneous basis on which scientists rely when they want to understand the mysteries of the pyramids. Among other things, it is hard to assume and believe that Neolithic people, so some 4,500 years ago, according to Egyptologists, designed, drew plans, coordinated and then carried out the construction of such colossal edifices, yet contemporary engineers and physicists are not able to do it today even with the help of powerful computers and current construction technology. They have not yet understood that there is a well-determined sense of manifestation of things in creation, which always comes from the top down. The calculations, results and magnitudes on the physical plane, which help to build the pyramid, naturally derive from its higher projection on the etheric subtle plane, because what I saw synthesized in the image of that hologram was actually the projection of the pyramid starting from the etheric plane. So it was not just a simple hologram, but, through a technology that I don't understand even now, it allowed the vision of the pyramid and its projection directly into the etheric plane. At this stage, the pyramid gains meaning and inner strength, but it is not yet connected to the physical plane. All the calculations and results on this plane are just a natural consequence of the structures designed on the etheric level. Perhaps this is why contemporary architects and engineers do not yet have the knowledge of such an advanced project as the construction of a large-scale pyramid, because at this level of complexity, it is not enough just to make structural and strength calculations, but it is necessary to link it to a deep energetic base, which gives stability and durability to the project. Therefore, solutions of a subtle ethereal nature are needed first, and these then generate the concrete solution on the physical plane. Major Design Differences I realized from the images presented to me that in such a project one starts from a kind of stellar astrology, from a certain stellar configuration, with the place where the pyramid is to be built as a point of reference. At the high level of consciousness and understanding of cosmic laws that advanced alien civilizations have, the problem of building grandiose edifices involves a different approach that is much deeper and more complex than what we are used to on Earth, no matter how amazing these constructions may seem. The big problem with such earthly constructions, 
Whether we are talking about large and sophisticated skyscraper hotels or other kinds of buildings, is their durability over time, which is low. A durability of several hundred years would be a record for modern buildings, assuming that they are not subject to major destructive natural phenomena or weathering. Yet even with such weathering, which at times has been severe, the pyramids of Egypt have survived for more than 10,000 years, and others are even much older, almost from the beginning of the introduction of great resonator technology. What buildings do we have on earth that we can say will last at least a thousand years? By the very nature of the building materials that are used, they are doomed to perish. Even if they look stately and beautiful when new, and the technologies used for the interiors seem sophisticated, in reality they are all very flimsy and short-lived, the materials have no resistance over time, and 99% of the technology relies on electricity, the source of which can disappear or be suspended at any time. Today's technologies, however amazing they may seem to us, are still at an early stage of development because they have not gone beyond an elementary stage in conception and thinking. For the most part, they depend on each other, and this weakens the cohesive force of the underlying idea. The major conceptual leap forward in contemporary science has not yet been achieved, or rather it has not yet been officially accepted by the mass market. It is easy enough to erect steel bar skeletons of grandiose buildings, and make insulation out of various materials. But if the world's largest construction company were hired to build design and erect a great pyramid, like the one in Egypt, out of stone blocks alone, they would most likely abandon the job in a matter of days. It would be extraordinary to have the technology to assemble such a construction, similar or identical to the Great Pyramid of Egypt, in a coherent way, to the millimeter or even fractions of a millimeter, not to mention the work of conceiving and designing it. But how can contemporary architects and engineers design and build such a colossus, when they have not yet been able to learn or understand how the Great Pyramid was built, or its interior structure? And the pyramid in Egypt is relatively small in size and complexity compared to what, for example, the Great Pyramid of Atlantis once was. The inability of contemporary architectural science and construction engineering comes from the lack of a superior understanding of what it means to form, to resonate energetically and to sustain it in the subtle dimensions of creation. A magnificent construction, such as a Great Pyramid, involves an accumulation of interdisciplinary knowledge, and by this I do not mean architecture, strength of materials, installations, interior design, etc. What I want to emphasize is that true science has a universal nature and also involves, in addition to the laws, equations, and standards that define it, a different kind of knowledge, such as the subtle energetic relationships between celestial bodies, their mutual impact, the occult significance of the resonances that develop in this way, how they can be used over time, the profound science of cosmic cycles, and others, aspects that I have seen and understood from the fragments presented to me on the holographic screen. Moreover, the design of such a construction takes into account both the general macrocosmic elements, which ensure its stability and durability over time, and the microcosmic elements, highlighted by the specific resonance of the space in which the construction is made, the general resonance of the DNA of the race of beings that comes into contact with it, as well as other specific elements, such as the purpose of that construction. Therefore, the physical pyramid is conceived in relation to all the main aspects of the being and the reality surrounding it, but especially to those of a subtle nature, the specific resonance of the DNA, the psychomental states, the geographical location, the influences of planetary and stellar energies, the purpose attributed to that construction and so on. Specific Stellar Configuration I have seen how the design of the pyramid by those beings began with the analysis of the star map of the area of the galaxy in which the Earth is located. Then various connections were made between several stars to find certain combinations that provided results of both a spatial nature, through the structure of the respective configuration and a temporal nature, synchronized time periods and their precise duration. With each movement or search for a star, a wealth of information appeared in the huge hologram, attached to the edges. From what I could see, I realized that pyramids came in many forms, with different shapes, different angles, being beveled or pointed, four-sided or multi-sided, stepped or smooth, and, of course, serving different purposes. All these features were not at all accidental, but related to the cosmic energetic influences of a particular stellar configuration, under whose patronage a pyramid was to be built. As I have said, the pyramid is not just a simple material construction, but encompasses a whole series of interrelated subtle aspects, 
each of which has a certain affinity with a particular vibrational frequency, a particular geographical area, a particular psychometal state, etc. After the extraterrestrial beings chose the stellar configuration, I saw how in the central area of that configuration an energetic cloud gradually began to form, which took more and more shape based on each new building block that was created or chosen by those beings. Then I saw how lines began to appear in the middle of that cloud, designating a precise and quite complicated space. I quickly realized that this was the inside of the pyramid. The technology that made that design possible, which correlated very precisely with other elements, such as stellar energy influx, was astonishing. The choice of the stellar configuration resulted in an intricate shape appearing in the middle, representing the interior of the pyramid. The schematic structure arose simply by tuning into the energy resonances manifesting within the stellar configuration. Even more astounding than this was to observe that every block of stone, every angle used, every space created and every dimension that was chosen, absolutely all were in direct connection with something in that stellar configuration. Nothing was put randomly, or in everything was justified by an extraordinary mutual affinity between the pyramid and the group of stars, that was chosen at the beginning of the construction of that pyramid and that had a precise configuration. It was a very complicated design, carried out entirely on the etheric plane. As I said, it started at the level of the inner structure of the pyramid, which gradually appeared in the center of the hologram. This overlapped in a certain way on the stellar configuration that had been chosen, indicating all the areas of correspondence with a lot of data and symbols. Approximately in the middle of it, at the most important point of energetic influence of the stellar arrangement, the space or main chamber of the pyramid was designed. For example, in the case of the Great Pyramid of Egypt, that space would correspond to the king's chamber. Then the rooms, galleries and secondary corridors would be added until the last niche was completed. Ethereal Design and Specific Stellar Resonances In the holographic images I saw, any structural elements of the pyramid appeared as a result of the energetic resonance, created by the specific stellar configuration that had been established for that pyramid. For example, in the case of the three pyramids on the Giza Plateau in Egypt, their dimensions, even though they are in harmony with many specific elements and characteristics of our planet, are designed to respect the ratios corresponding to the geometric structure of the stellar configuration, at the time of the beginning of the actual construction, and those corresponding to the dimensions of the three main stars in Orion's belt. Even this simple fact would be enough to block any attempt at a scientific explanation of the construction of the three pyramids, for how could the ancient Egyptians have known the diameters of the three main stars of the belt? This is impossible, if you limit yourself to the observation of the three stars with free sight which apparently was the only possibility the Egyptians had at that time. And yet the three pyramids faithfully and proportionally respect both the dimensions of the three stars of Orion's belt and their relative positioning within the belt. In this way, each line in each area of the pyramid was in detail projected to scale, holographically and directly onto the etheric plane. I then received telepathically the information that, practically speaking, Conceiving and designing only on the physical plane of a great pyramid is impossible or would be hopelessly doomed to failure, because it could not effectively resolve and correlate the immensity of data required for that construction to be viable and endure. Calculations and engineering methods in the physical plane do not allow the pyramid to be designed according to the usual methods, with current formulas, calculation techniques and knowledge, until a certain stage, beyond which unsolvable problems arise. This is because the parameters included in the construction of a pyramid are much more numerous and often unknown to contemporary engineers and scientists. That's why, even if they wanted to start designing and building such an enormous construction, they would soon reach technical and even conceptual impossibilities, which would make it impossible to build it further. For example, it would be difficult for many contemporary scientists and engineers to understand that pyramids are in fact very important communication centers, connected to the specific energy of stars or huge motherships, which have been chosen to form a certain configuration, to fulfill a certain purpose, usually of a galactic nature. This is important because the giant motherships of highly technologically advanced civilizations are often planetary in size, and their missions are sometimes very long, from a few years to tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years. Pyramids were therefore used in exactly the same way as we now use communication centers, which involves sending and receiving information. For very long distances, such as cosmic interstellar distances, the transmitters also had to be very large and powerful, which is why pyramids were used as subtle telepath transmitters. 24 years. At that time, 
the area where the three great pyramids stand today was not a sandy desert, the Sahara practically did not exist at that time. Instead of today's desert, I saw lush vegetation with large rivers flowing into the Nile. It was clearly conveyed to me telepathically, in combination with the frequency game, that the whole operation of building the architectural complex near Cairo, including the preparation of the plateau, took about 24 Earth years. At first I was a little surprised, as I imagined that, given the advanced technology of the Syrians from Orion, the construction of the three pyramids could have taken much less time, but that was no doubt simply my own uninformed assessment. In addition, the work was not continuous, as I have seen periods when the site was devoid of the presence of aliens and their ships. Later, watching in amazement how the three pyramids were built, I realized that they were in fact worked at a rather accelerated pace for the 24 years, and that under other conditions their construction could have taken hundreds of years, if not more. It started with the proper preparation of the site for construction, as the plateau was uneven and covered with earth. The images showed me massive clearing in that area and leveling of the surface to create the rock-solid plateau. There were many ships of different types in that area, standing motionless in the air at a certain height, arranged in layers or levels. Some of them carried out the preparation of the plateau, using a technology based on a kind of beams that leveled the area. As I saw that operation, it seemed that the air rippled under the ship passing over a certain area, and in its wake everything became somehow flattened, but not by violent destruction, but rather by a kind of liquefaction of the rocks and proper absorption. Alien Involvement in Pyramid Building One interesting aspect I noticed while watching those extraordinary images was in relation to the origin of alien ships and beings, in that context of mankind's very distant past, to talk about their alien belonging was somewhat inappropriate. The ships and beings in question did indeed come from other planets, but they had been integrating with human beings on our planet for thousands of years. Therefore, they did not come to Earth only for the construction of the three great pyramids in Egypt, but their presence was ancient, since the times when Atlantis had great economic and spiritual power and influence over all other continents and even long before that. In Egypt, the three pyramids were built mainly by extraterrestrial civilizations descended from the main Syrian civilization of the Sirius A system. In addition to their representatives, I was shown other ships belonging to different civilizations, which also contributed to the construction of the pyramids or assisted certain stages of it. In total, I saw the participation of four different extraterrestrial civilizations, to which was added the important presence of wise beings from Atlantis. The erection of the pyramids was a team work, in the sense that the Atlanteans, with their specific ships, worked together with extraterrestrial beings from several civilizations, but the major influence of the Syrian civilizations was followed, for as I have said, the Great Pyramid, as well as the other two smaller pyramids were built in the Syrian style. In and around the site I could see a veritable aerial landhill of ships, which was extremely well organized and precise. Each ship knew exactly what it had to do and everything seemed to be perfectly calculated and directed. On the ground, however, there were very few Atlantean and alien beings, and quite a distance around that construction area I could see a few locals, quite primitive ENK human beings, just watching the activity at the site. However, in some of the images that followed, I could see some of those natives performing simple activities within the site. I was very curious to see the real way in which the pyramids were built, without oscillating between hypotheses and assumptions that are circulated. From the beginning I understood that that was the exclusive work of Atlantean and extraterrestrial ships and technology, mainly based on crystal energy. There was not even a question of the locals doing anything about the pyramid building, or having any initiative to do so. The distance to such a possibility was similar to that between our sun and the star Sirius. From what I saw, the locals were ENK beings from a lower branch, with a primitive level of living. Such a work would have been absolutely impossible for them at any stage of its realization, at the rudimentary level of living and knowledge they were at. I was then reminded, fleetingly, of the vision of contemporary engineers, archaeologists and Egyptologists, who apparently had great faith in the technical capabilities of the ancient Egyptians, the chisel, hammer and rope, plus pulleys, logs and some copper pieces, for in their vision these were the main tools with which the immense and complex pyramids on the Giza plateau were built and erected. I didn't see even one of these tools in the pictures I was shown, but even if the locals had countless such objects, they would have served no purpose. I doubt that those ENK beings could have cut and chipped even a single block of stone out of the millions that make up the three pyramids, 
let alone transported them over such great distances and then assembled them to the millimeter into a highly complex whole. Not to mention the construction ideas, the astonishing engineering solutions, the size and weight of some of the stone blocks and much more. It is true, however, that at one point, in a few images, I saw some natives right in the site, moving and performing simple operations on some stone blocks in the storage area, holding a few tools and manipulating some thin metal bars, or drawing colored signs with some bundles of straw. I then received information that they were being telepathically guided by some of the tall beings on the plateau, who were dressed in silver white and whom I could see walking slowly between different points of the construction. The construction of the three great pyramids on the Giza plateau. Beyond all these general elements, I would first of all focus on the conception and design of the pyramids. This aspect, which could not be fully understood even today, is nevertheless attributed to almost primitive beings, along with the actual erection of the stone columns. Seeing the extraordinary complexity of such work in the holographic images presented to me, I was astounded by the lack of discernment and even logic, to put it mildly, with which contemporary scholars, led by leading Egyptologists, argue the modern version of how the pyramid complex near Cairo was erected. I keep repeating these things over and over again, precisely out of a desire to draw attention to the illogic that is perpetuated in the form of competent opinions, but what is really sad is that the population takes all these academic solutions to be true. But they are nothing more than the manifestation of a huge scientific hubris and an inability to understand and accept anything higher than the current level of technological development. To this is added a lamentable indoctrination of the population so that they do not know the truth, which could give unseen wings to the desire for progress and freedom. As for the actual construction of the three pyramids, the first thing I was shown was where the stone blocks were cut, in other words, I saw the stone quarry that provided the building material for the three great pyramids. Unexpectedly for me, it was not in the territory of today's Egypt, but further south of it, in the territory of what is now Libya, but not far from its border. The image then focused on cylindrical devices, which were embedded in the ground at various points in the quarry. They were similar to those I saw in images from the Persian Gulf 400,000 years ago, being used by the Syrians for drilling. It wasn't quite clear to me what role they played in that rock quarry, but I did see the correlation between the laser-like beams of light coming out of those cylinders and the lasers of a working ship, floating noiselessly over the mountain. It was a large ship, impressive in its somewhat irregular appearance, which actually gave me the impression of a working ship as it had many appendages on its sides. I saw that she was responsible for the vertical sectioning of the quarry stone blocks, as the quarrying of the stone was done from the top of the mountain down vertically. The ship always positioned itself above another spot on the mountain, guided by its own lasers, then it vertically sectioned the mountain rock along the four sides of the upper surface, using thicker beams of light, which were glowing white. This generated the shape of the block of stone, after which the great ship moved on to cut another block of stone in another part of the quarry. Once the block of stone was thus cut into the mountain, a transport ship came above it, linking its movement with that of a sphere-shaped device resembling an automatic drone, it flew to the block cut into the mountain and, with the help of laser beams it emitted, cut the block both at the top and at the bottom, allowing it to be caught and lifted to the transport ship by means of a special force field. Before that, however, I saw that the drone was inscribing the block of rock, always on the bottom right side. The code in question was not carved or painted, but I understood that the area where it was inscribed was energetically activated in such a way that the composition of the stone was altered on that region. It became more structured there, as if it were an ordered and luminous crystal. The code as such was a rectangle in which several lines and squares were printed, much like today's electronic signature. It would light up when a certain beam of light was directed at it, like a kind of specialized reader. The transport ships were rectangular and each of them had two symmetrically arranged hemispheres underneath, which most likely generated an attraction field that supported the stone blocks underneath. As I have said, when a ship reached above a block of stone cut from the mountain, it was sectioned underneath, and it was then trapped in a specific energy field emanating from the ship. I could clearly see how this was done, as a beam of diffused white light came out of the two hemispheres and enveloped the block of stone. Almost immediately it began to levitate, rising up to below the ship, a short distance from those hemispheres. Then the ship would speed off on an aerial highway, carrying the block of stone to the site. If the blocks of stone were relatively small, then a ship would carry two such blocks in one trip, if they were larger, then the ships would carry only one block. 
For very large or specially shaped blocks I saw that, after being roughly cut from the mountain, they were transported to an adjoining area, where they were finished separately in a meticulous manner, being brought to the required dimensions by several mobile devices which seemed to be automatically directed. Above the quarry, at an appreciable height in the air, a much larger ship stood absolutely still, whose diameter I estimated at least 120 meters. I then received telepathically the knowledge that her role was to supervise and direct the work in that quarry. I could see perfect rows of small transport ships coming and going to the quarry carrying the medium-sized blocks of stone. The precision and dynamics of those movements of the ships and drones was flawless, it seemed as if a giant computer was ordering every operation, both flying and directing the ships and cutting and lifting the stone blocks. Also telepathically I understood that this always happened with a profound science, by the time the stone blocks were cut, it was already known exactly where each one would be placed in the Great Pyramid construction. The cut blocks were always those waiting to be placed in the order that had been decided, but as I was to find out, the complete finish was given to them at the building site. There I saw two main areas, the storage area for the stone blocks and the actual construction area. The blocks were taken in a certain order, never randomly. I could say that no stone block was the same as the others, but had its specific integration into the construction of the pyramid. I did not see, for example, stocks of stone blocks forming a pile. There were, of course, blocks on the ground, but not in piles, and those that existed were immediately taken and integrated into the extremely laborious construction of the pyramid. Collaboration between Atlanteans and extraterrestrials. On the ground, I saw a tall Atlantean man, dressed in white and resembling a priest, overseeing the general construction. I couldn't say how I knew that tall man was Atlantean, but nevertheless, the information was clear in my mind. In the area of the warehouse, I saw two Syrian extraterrestrial beings, as they had pearly white skin, elongated heads, and wore splendid blue jumpsuits with certain golden insignia. These three seemed to coordinate the general work, but I also saw other beings within the site perimeter, about ten, performing various tasks. Two of them were also Atlanteans. My attention was drawn to three of those beings, who were taller than the others, I estimated they were over 2.5 meters tall, and wore some sort of silver-white jumpsuits, slightly translucent, which continued like a cape behind them. So, on the plateau, there was a mix of races, as some beings had hair on their heads, while others didn't. Some had darker skin, even towards brown, but most of them had white skin. The Atlant priest and the two Syrian beings in charge of the general work, had in their hands a monitor resembling a large tablet, through which they correlated the various actions that were required. Absolutely everything in the construction was done by levitating ships. All I could hear was a soft hum or faint rustling noise. But this was probably due to the movement of the ships through the air, as the sky was filled with their presence. I realized that those beings, especially the tall ones dressed in silver and white jumpsuits, were in constant telepathic contact either with the general command center, which I could not see, or with the central brain that coordinated the movement of the ships. On the Atlant priest I saw that he had on his right temple, seemingly glued over his long, white hair with blue highlights, a device that could be likened to a modern-day Bluetooth, but somewhat larger and more elongated in shape. Every being and ship there knew exactly what it had to do, and everything was running with extraordinary precision and perfection. The timing and correlation of all operations was truly impressive. In fact, at the magnitude and complexity of such constructions, I don't know how it could have been any other way for the work to be efficient. Even so, as I said, the construction of the whole architectural complex took more than two decades. An important fact to mention is that I did not notice any pilots in the small transport ships. These were fairly simple, rectangular ships, but unmanned, somewhat like today's drones. I concluded that everything was linked and guided from an overall command center. Advanced Technologies Then I was shown very closely how the respective stone blocks fit and assembled perfectly into the intended place. The process was entirely technological. On the ground I saw cylindrical, dark smoky pillar-like devices, similar to those in the quarry, but taller than them, I think each was about 5 meters high. They had a hemisphere at the top, which made them look somewhat like tall mushrooms. As far as I could tell, those cylindrical devices were arranged in a certain pattern and at certain points, somehow in pairs, forming a kind of corridor. When a block of stone had to be moved and embedded in the body of the pyramid, 
Two of the beings present on the plateau would place themselves in front of one of these cylinders, and with just a gesture of the hand would probably trigger an internal command, as the sphere at the top of the cylinder would begin to vibrate imperceptibly, while emitting a specific, high-frequency but not annoying sound. From the hemisphere, a beam of light, like a laser, then appeared, intersecting with the beam emitted by another cylinder, and the two lasers scanned the crowd of stone blocks, identifying the exact block with the code needed to be placed in the pyramid assembly, exactly in the order set for construction. I don't know what that technology was based on, but I could see the stone blocks actually lifting into the air, levitating, and then they would pass through the rows of cylinders heading towards the pyramid. There they would be driven exactly into a certain area of it, rotating in the air until they reached the position where they could be integrated perfectly. I also saw how some of the beings on the ground checked each time how these operations were being carried out, the pace being quite fast. They never spoke, but I felt that there was always an exchange of telepathic messages between them, linking the different phases of the work. They started with the Great Pyramid and I noticed that the development of the construction was not only done from one part, but that it was approached simultaneously from several regions. As I said, the stone blocks were brought and placed with precision and in a predetermined order, creating the feeling of a living organism of the construction. Even if it is a difficult concept to assimilate, this is how I felt when the images were presented to me, because as I said, the holographic screen technology of the Apellos made it somewhat easier for me to perceive those times not only visually, but also mentally and psychologically. I understood that everything had a well-defined meaning in that construction, that each stone had a direct meaning and correlation with a certain cosmic influence and that nothing was left to chance. If this were not the case, how could those magnificent constructions have remained standing even after more than 13 millennia? Watching how the pyramids were built, from their conception to their practical construction, I realized once again the huge gap between humanity's current understanding of the laws governing life and the universe, and that of ancient advanced civilizations on Earth or the extraterrestrial civilizations that watch over us. I felt, for example, a kind of symbiosis between each piece that was added to the pyramid and its overall whole. Absolutely every detail of the stone blocks correlated with a particular cosmic element, which facilitated the continuity of important energy flows to the pyramid, always in relation to that stellar configuration. I saw, for example, the exact moment when they cut, along a certain precise line, a certain side of a stone block, and then the image focused exactly on the embedding of that stone block on one of the edges of the pyramid, calling on the direction of the angled cut line, which pointed to a star in the Orion constellation. The image then immediately showed me, in a separate quadrant in the top right corner, the sector of the cosmos to which that star belonged. The same principle of construction, which involved complex geometric arrangements of the stone blocks and the angles between them, correlated with important astral moments and cosmic configurations, was followed in detail for all the stones in the pyramid set. In their final form, the pyramids were perfectly polished, like highly valuable pieces of art. For contemporary science, such aspects that go beyond the strictly material framework are meaningless, because scholars do not understand their significance. In fact, this is the main reason why the mechanical age has not yet been overcome, but the same somewhat primitive ideas of propulsion and energy generation are perpetuated. It is true, however, that there is also a highly placed world elite that has had, and has access to a lot of extraterrestrial knowledge and contacts. They possess astonishing technologies, which they use for their own personal benefit, on an impressive scale. But I will not go into that here. All three main pyramids on the Giza Plateau near Cairo were erected at the same time, but the earliest work was still on the Great Pyramid. Soon after, construction began on the other two pyramids. It was a monumental and large-scale work, which, as I said, took about 24 years. Further to the south and a little to the side of the three great pyramids, other pyramids were built, as well as several temples, albeit smaller, but part of the same overall project. I was shown that they faithfully corresponded to the stellar arrangement in the cosmos, which was chosen to subtly influence the energy of this architectural ensemble. From what I was shown, I saw the phase of the construction of the Great Pyramid in which its base and corners had already been slightly raised. In the middle of it, in the interior, I noticed a much greater activity, it was a special movement, an activity of a different kind, because that was, in a way, the very heart of the pyramid, its essential structure that was to give it life and make it effective later. If the stone blocks on the outside were simpler and somewhat similar, things were different on the inside, 
requiring great care and great refinement for the extremely complicated construction. Those blocks were very different from the ones on the outside, although when assembled they appeared to be just as simple, rectangular. In reality, they had different shapes and very precise angles, so they fitted together perfectly. Every block of stone there was practically one of a kind. It was also then that I saw that in some areas inside the Great Pyramid a different kind of material was used, different from the stone taken from that great quarry. The consistency of those blocks was different, some of them were black and shiny, others with red inserts, highly polished, being cut into many angles and complex shapes. As an unusual element, I noticed that under the king's chamber was placed a round-shaped structure with spokes on the circumference, resembling a cogwheel. The piece was very complex in its assembly. I felt that this mysterious shape, like a star with many spokes, the presence of which is completely unknown to contemporary researchers, had a very important role, but which I did not understand. No one imagines that between the king's chamber and the queen's chamber, a little lower down in the great pyramid section, there would be anything but massive blocks of stone. But it was made clear to me, that this is false and that both that area and many others in the great pyramid are actually full of tunnels, small chambers or even larger chambers. The final appearance of the three great pyramids. In their final phase of construction, the pyramids had perfectly smooth faces on the outside, completely different from what we see today. They shone dazzlingly in the sunlight, but as I soon realized, that glow was aided not only by the polishing of the white stone that covered the pyramid faces, but also by a special substance that was applied to them. The grandeur of the three pyramids could be admired even at night, and it was a perfect, otherworldly spectacle. At first only the Great Pyramid shone, but in the images that followed I saw how all three pyramids spread a fairy light, accompanied by the less intense light emanating from the other secondary constructions around, which completed the whole. The splendid images showed me the whole architectural complex from a certain height, the three pyramids being just like real cosmic beacons. At the top of each pyramid, I saw a crystal, but the one on the Great Pyramid was huge, like an obelisk, and emitted the strongest light. Therefore, contrary to scientific assumptions and calculations, there was never any object other than that giant crystal at the top of the Great Pyramid, which served as a formidable cosmic relay, both for receiving and transmitting information. I was then shown an image from near one side of the Great Pyramid, and then I saw that its radiance was mainly due to a slightly transparent and somewhat phosphorescent substance that enveloped the entire pyramid. If I were to make a comparison, I would say that substance resembled a kind of transparent gel that shone brightly. It wasn't a diffuse brightness, but rather something that reflected light, so when you looked at the pyramids, the overall impression was that they were made of that substance. Even more than that, its structure became somewhat translucent, as if allowing to see what was inside. The stone blocks were not visible at all, everything was perfectly polished and covered with that special substance. However, as I could see in the images presented to me, after several thousand years, that substance lost some of its qualities and even began to disappear from certain areas of the pyramid. For example, around 5200 BCE to 4800 BCE, as far as I could estimate, only the area at the top of the Great Pyramid still retained traces of that astonishing substance, however, the crystal was still at the top of the construction. Otherwise, the pyramid had become matte, and to my great surprise, it was buried about halfway in sand. The other two smaller pyramids were even more covered with sand. I could also see that the faces of the pyramids were beginning to be eaten away by the passage of time and weathering, as the stone blocks were visible in many places on the exterior. However, almost 6,000 years had passed since its construction. Secret Structures and Rituals Inside the Great Pyramid Intrigued by the fact that the pyramid was half buried in sand, I wanted to see other elements related to that unsettling transformation. The images changed, showing me a view from a wider angle, and then I saw instead of the abundant vegetation and water, that existed in the area at the time of the construction of that architectural complex, the desert of sand that reigned everywhere. The climate change must have been terrible and quite rapid, but telepathically I understood that much of it was also caused by a brief but quite intense war between certain alien factions. I was then shown more recent images of pharaonic palaces and temples built around the pyramid complex, with an obvious growth and evolution of the Egyptian population that abounded in that area. Then I was again shown the Great Pyramid buried in sand, but the image somehow penetrated inside the pyramid, through its walls, so that I could see both outside and inside simultaneously. 
in its interior space, through galleries and chambers not yet discovered in the pyramid's physical structure, I saw several human beings doing various jobs and even having access, in a way I didn't immediately understand, to moving blocks of stone inside and entering certain hidden areas of the pyramid. Puzzled, I insisted on this and then the picture changed, showing me three Egyptians, who by their clothing and attire appeared to be of high rank, most likely priests. They were in a rather large gallery, but not in the great gallery of the pyramid. I wasn't shown how they got there, but I did see how the older priest stopped at one point by a stone block. He held in his left palm a stand on which was a small sphere that spread a bright, yellow light around it. I saw the priest then utter a string of sounds, with a special intonation of voice, modulated and quite strong. I noticed that the sounds produced seemed to be swallowed up by the structure of the pyramid instead of reverberating off the walls. I could tell from the way the priest was chanting that a certain frequency had to be reached to trigger a certain process. After a few seconds and while he was still uttering those sounds, the other two priests lower in rank gently pushed with their hands a block of stone from the floor and then the one above it. Both stones then rotated easily at an angle of about 45 degrees. The three priests then entered a rather large room. The image then depicted a dynamic and overall view of the pyramid, in which I saw much of its structure, which is not known today. There are many other hidden chambers and corridors, which are not even suspected by researchers, however, lately some of them could be identified by perfecting some technology, but it is not enough, because the data are still too elusive. However, from what has been presented to me, I can say that things do not appear as scientists think. For example, all these chambers, galleries and spaces that are numerous in the pyramid were not primarily for the storage of things, although in some of them, as I saw in that extraordinary overview of the internal structure of the Great Pyramid, there are objects, some of them quite amazing, but other spaces are empty. So certain priests and initiates had access to some of the keys to the secret spaces in the pyramid. This also happened when I saw many beings inside the pyramid, most of whom were workers. Through telepathic transmission I understood that what these people were doing there was repairing and maintaining the pyramid, probably due to the damage caused by the war. At the same time, I could see outside the pyramid a vast work to free it from the burden of the sand that surrounded it, indeed, those were works carried out by the native Egyptians, probably at the order of the pharaoh of that time, who knew too well that the pyramids represented the heritage of the gods and had to be treated with the utmost respect. However, I felt from the images, as a subtle transmission, how these magnificent constructions no longer conveyed the same kind of information, and energy as in the early stages after their construction, when they had a colossal and profoundly transformative effect. It was as if a kind of wave of forgetfulness had taken hold of people's minds, which saw the pyramids only as physical objects, extraordinary in their grandeur, but remaining only at this limited level of understanding. Somehow, they had lost over time the ability to understand what the pyramids really represented, and no longer felt their extraordinary subtle energetic influence. There had been a hardening of their energetic structure and consciousness, which no longer allowed them to understand the occult elements and higher teachings, so that they could achieve a resonance bridge with the energy of the pyramids on the plateau. Therefore, only the priests and the initiated still retained some of the true knowledge, but even among them, the terrible seal of forgetfulness had begun to spread.